Hello, thank you for joining me today for my presentation on how you can make healthier choices for a healthier future. Today's class is an overview of healthy lifestyle principles, which we'll cover in a lot more detail in other presentations to follow. Living your life as if your health depends on it, because it does, and adding life to your years as well as years to your life. These are the things we really want to accomplish these series of presentations. We are 72nd in the world on health. Now, this information is from a report published by the World Health Organization in the year 2000. We are also number one in healthcare costs. One might ask the question, if we're 72nd in overall health, but we spend more on health, where is all the money going to? Well, it's not going to health care, it's going to sick care. And uh, this is how our government keeps us asking the wrong questions, because if we keep asking the wrong questions, we'll never get the right answers. The questions we ask are based on the context of health care, whereas in fact, what we do for health care is virtually nothing. What they call health care is actually sick care. And our country is very sick. We're sick primarily because of the types of choices we make. And the choices we make are basically programmed into us by the fast food industry, by agribusiness, by drug companies. And these are the choices that they want us to make because it's good for their bottom line. Well, we're going to be talking about other choices you can make that will dramatically increase your health and your vitality and your enjoyment of life. This slide is a basic overview about cholesterol because all of you are are aware that certain cholesterol is bad, certain cholesterol is good, and I want everybody to have a baseline of understanding exactly how much cholesterol is good and what cholesterol is good and what cholesterol is bad because we're going to discuss what we can each do to help increase the good and decrease the bad cholesterol. So for total cholesterol, we all should strive for something less than 200. Keeping in mind, however, that cholesterol is a basic building block for all of your hormones. So we need a certain amount of cholesterol so we can make adequate hormones. You do not want to drive cholesterol down too low. But the general consensus appears to be that less than 200 gives us plenty of cholesterol to make hormones but doesn't increase our cardiovascular risk. Anything over 200 is considered undesirable. HDL is referred to as the good cholesterol. We want to have at least 40 of this, ideally more than 60. Typically, it's exercise that brings this up. Certain nutrients can bring it up as well, and we'll review those as we progress through these courses. LDL is the bad cholesterol. Now, we don't want LDL to be above 100. The causes of low amounts of good HDL and high amounts of the bad LDL cholesterol are eating lots of refined sugars and other refined carbohydrates such as white flour, white rice, white potatoes, fruit juice, high saturated fat intake, physical inactivity or lack of exercise, cigarette smoking, and certain drugs. This report was published by the federal government, specifically by the National Institutes of Health. It's referred to as the AT3P guidelines. ATP3 stands for Adult Treatment Panel 3 guideline. In this study, the federal government determined that everybody with elevated bad cholesterol should be treated first with lifestyle changes that are effective in lowering bad cholesterol levels. And this approach was designated as the therapeutic lifestyle change approach. And furthermore, they stated that lifestyle changes are the most cost-effective means to reduce risk for cardiovascular disease and reduce metabolic syndrome, which we'll get into in one of the following slides. Notice they mention that diet and lifestyle changes are the first thing that should be tried. How many of you have had your doctor not discuss diet and lifestyle changes at all but want to give you a statin drug immediately without even trying diet and lifestyle changes. Well, you should be aware that our own federal government as well as the drug companies indicate that those drugs should only be given once you've tried healthy diet and lifestyle changes and those changes haven't been enough to help you lower cholesterol enough. We just saw a reference to metabolic syndrome. What is metabolic syndrome? Well, it's when you have any three or more of the following risk factors. Abdominal obesity, men with waists greater than 40 inches, women with waists greater than 35 inches, altered blood lipids, that means high triglycerides, elevated bad cholesterol or low good cholesterol, high blood pressure, 
insulin resistance, like glucose intolerance, a tendency towards blood clots, or a tendency towards inflammation. That would be like arthritis, asthma, rashes, etc. If you have three or more of any of these factors going on, then you have metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is important because if you have metabolic syndrome, you've got twice the risk of cardiovascular disease and five times the risk of getting diabetes. Why is metabolic syndrome important? Because those with metabolic syndrome have twice the risk of heart attack and stroke and five times the risk of diabetes. And along with the risk of diabetes, the risk of blindness, limb amputations, diabetic neuropathy, which is chronic pain, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You do not want to get diabetes. In the New England Journal of Medicine in 1998, they published a story in which they stated that persons with lower health risks tend to live longer than those with higher health risks. That's kind of common sense. But furthermore, they stated that not only do people with better health habits survive longer, but in such persons, disability is postponed and compressed into fewer years at the end of life. And that is illustrated by this graph. Where you see the black line is the line of vitality for most people today. And that's why you'll notice around the age of 30 or so, the line starts declining more steeply. And it's during this time of this steeper decline that people start getting mini strokes and arthritis and all sorts of other health problems. They get sick more frequently. They have less energy. They don't feel like doing things. They lay around the house watching TV all the time rather than getting outside and enjoying sports and activities. Their life is one of progressive deterioration, lack of health and vitality. Now, on the other hand, you look at the upper line, the blue line, and you notice it doesn't really start a steeper decline until around the age of 70. And then its rate of decline is about the same as, as the other one. You notice each line ends differently. The black line with a steeper decline ends around 80. That's when most of those people tend to die. Although, leading up to that, a lot of them wish they were dead. The blue line, on the other hand, shows that these people tend to die around the age of 90. So they live 10 years longer. But what's really much more important is the gap between the lines indicates the increased vitality and health. So as they're aging, they can enjoy their retirement. They can travel around the world. They can go camping and hiking and fishing and enjoy themselves, whereas people that don't follow healthy choices, they're busy doing things in hospitals and in bed and from the TV set. Well, it turns out about 108 million American adults are overweight or obese. That's 60% of the American adult population. 30% of children are overweight or obese. Now, the adults that are overweight or obese have an increased risk of high blood pressure, stroke, elevated cholesterol, arthritis, diabetes, sleep apnea, heart disease, certain cancers, gallbladder disease, hysterectomy, constant tiredness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, what's the relationship of overweight to all causes? of death, it's pretty substantial. You'll notice this graph shows that people who are lower in weight, they have a lower body mass index, and you'll see that across the bottom of the scale. Those with a body mass index of 25 to 30, they've got low risk of dying from all causes. Those with a body mass index of 30 to 40 have a medium risk, and those in excess of 40 have a very high risk of death from all causes. Weight loss does not always lead to better health. Weight and basal metabolic index do not evaluate what's referred to as body compartment. That's basically the type of weight that you carry and therefore do not reveal if weight changes result in loss of fat-free mass, muscle mass, or gain in fat mass. Basically, body compartments relate to water, fat, and lean mass, lean mass equating to muscle. This chart shows a lady in the middle who's overweight, needs to lose weight. The lady on the left, lady on the right portray a slimmer lady. The one on the left has lost weight the healthy way. The one on the right has lost weight the unhealthy way. Now, if you look at the lady on the left, down to the left of her, you'll see a diagram that symbolizes the cross-section through her abdominal wall. You'll notice that she has a fair amount of muscle there, and behind the muscle, reduced fat. The woman on the right, however, you'll notice her muscle is thinner, and she's got a lot more fat behind the muscle. This next slide is a continuation of the previous slide showing down below these two women where the healthy woman on the left has lost weight in a way that's decreased her blood pressure. It's cleaned out excess cholesterol from the vessel walls, increasing the diameter of the vessels through which the blood flows, increasing her blood supply, increasing oxygen of the tissue, increasing her energy, 
improving blood sugar and insulin levels and leading to healthy hormone balance. The woman on the right hand, however, her arteries are plugged up with cholesterol. There's been no changes in the cholesterol. The little starry things you see at the bottom of the diagram are symbolic of hormone imbalance and inflammatory products. So she's still got high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high glucose, excess insulin from insulin resistance, and hormone imbalance. Not a good situation to be in. So what is healthy body composition about? That's why we refer to our programs here in the office as body composition programs and not weight loss programs. Well, with healthy body composition, you want healthy levels of body fat. We all need some fat, but not too much. Adequate muscle mass is also important, and it's also important to have the right amount of water in your body and that that water be in the right place. In the Journal of Nutrition in 1997, a paper was published in which they stated that no decline with age is as dramatic or potentially more significant than the decline in lean body mass or the decline in muscle. Furthermore, they stated in JAMA in 2001 that sarcopenia, or the loss of muscle mass that occurs as people age, and it's not from aging, it's from decreased physical activity as people age. They state that sarcopenia is the backdrop against which the drama of disease is played out. A body already depleted of protein because of aging is less able to withstand the protein catabolism, that means protein digestion or breakdown, that comes with acute illness or inadequate protein intake. And what they mean by that is that muscle is the major source of protein for functions such as antibody production, wound healing, and white blood cell production during illness. If the body's protein reserves are already depleted by sarcopenia, there's less to mobilize for illness. And what this means is that when you're sick, recovering from injury, or recovering from surgery, your body needs massive amounts of protein in order to heal. It's not possible for most people to eat enough protein during that time in order to give the body enough protein to heal properly. So what the body does is whatever amount of protein you need that you weren't able to consume in your diet, your body obtains that needed protein by breaking down the protein in your muscles and then reforming that protein into specific proteins it needs to heal. Heal from injury, heal from surgery, or heal from illness. So in other words, your muscles serve as your bank account of protein just as your bones serve as your bank account of minerals in the body. So how do you maintain muscle mass as you age? Well, you need adequate nutrition in the form of adequate protein in your diet. You need a aggressive physical therapy. Now, in this case, they're talking about exercise. And they say these become all the more important if muscle function and quality of life are to be preserved in the older population. Well, I kind of think that muscle function and quality of life are important, and I think you do too. Why physical activity? Just to build muscle? Well, that's important, but you'll also get a lot of other benefits. It enhances the health of our cardiovascular system and our respiratory system. So that means the heart and the blood vessels and our lungs all benefit from exercise. It helps protect and build muscle, which burns more calories and makes weight loss easier. It improves mental and emotional function. It reduces the risk of illness and death. It boosts energy. It decreases stress. It improves cholesterol and triglycerides, reduces blood pressure, increases insulin sensitivity, improves blood sugar control, counters anxiety and depression, helps you relax and improve sleep, and it burns calories and excess body fat. Who wouldn't want all those things? Now, this portrays the type of printout we get through our body composition analysis machine. It's called a bioimpedance analysis machine. It's used very easily. We place two electrodes on the foot and ankle and another two electrodes on the hand and wrist. We pass a small electrical current to the body you don't even feel it, not even a slight tingle. And it measures various aspects of your body composition. It measures lean muscle mass. It measures body fat. It measures how much water is inside of your cells and how much is outside of your cells, which reflects how well your body detoxifies. It measures how much muscle mass you have for your body size. It measures how healthy your cell walls are. These are all biomarkers of aging. Essentially, this measures your physiological age. We all know our chronological age based on your birth date. But we all know people that are older or younger than us in the way they feel and act, although they might be the same chronological age as we are. Well, there was a study recently, actually not too recently now, it's 1992. They did a doctor-supervised weight loss program with a medical food called Ultrameal, which is manufactured by Metagenics and SlimFast. And they found that over the 10 weeks of the study, the Ultrameal group lost a total of 11 pounds and the SlimFast group lost a total of 13 pounds. Well, at first glance, it looks like the SlimFast group won. But look closer and you'll see that the SlimFast group lost 11 pounds of muscle mass. 11 of the 13 pounds of weight loss was muscle. Only 2 pounds was fat. Whereas the Ultra Meal Medical Food group, they only not only didn't lose muscle mass, they gained muscle mass. They gained 4 pounds of muscle, which considering that they lost 11 pounds of weight means that they actually lost 15 pounds of fat 
gained four pounds of muscle for a net weight loss of 11 pounds. That's a huge difference between these two programs. In addition, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is an indicator of your metabolic rate, shows that the slim fast group slowed down their metabolism so that as soon as they go off the slim fast, they'll gain back that fat even fast. Whereas the ultra group, their metabolic rate didn't change at all. They'll keep the weight off. So the key here is to lose fat, not muscle. And a study conducted and published in the International Clinical Nutrition Review in 1991 states basically that body composition has a lot of benefit with a lot of different aspects of health for men and women. What are some of the benefits of healthy weight loss, which means fat loss? Decreased cardiovascular risk, decreased blood sugar and insulin levels, decreased blood pressure, decreased bad cholesterol and triglycerides and increased good cholesterol, decreased severity of sleep apnea, reduced symptoms of arthritis, improved gynecological conditions. Now we're going to discuss glycemic index and overweight. Some foods cause a rapid increase in blood sugar. These are called high glycemic foods. And there are a lot of doctors that believe that obesity is very much related to glycemic index. The lower the glycemic index and the glycemic load of the first meal, the less food is consumed in a subsequent meal. So if basically by eating the right foods, you tend to eat less. So not only are you eating healthier food, but you eat less of it, you eat less calories, helping you lose weight or keep it off. This is a page out of our first-line therapy book here at the office. This portrays typical cravings for carbohydrates. Usually by eating wrong foods, you have an urge to eat something like a cookie, which is high glycemic index. So you eat the cookie, that leads to high blood sugar, which leads to high insulin levels, which results in your blood sugar dropping too far and increases fat storage. That then increases your hunger, which increases your cravings for more high glycemic foods, and the process repeats itself. This leads to a blood sugar roller coaster and an insulin roller coaster, an energy roller coaster, and an emotional roller coaster for many people as well. This depicts the upper right-hand portion of these pages, which compares low glycemic index foods to high glycemic index foods. And you'll notice it's really not complicated. The foods in the right, they're all processed. The foods in the left aren't. So basically, if it's in a bag, a box, a can, a jar, you want to avoid it. You want to eat most of your food in as close to its natural state as possible, as close to the tree, ground, or shrub as possible. Portion sizes and eating frequency. It's important to not skip meals. Skipping meals cause you to lose muscle. Eat frequently. Three small meals and two to three snacks every day helps maintain blood sugar and insulin levels, and it also helps to use medical foods to achieve weight loss goals, to help you with certain other health challenges you may have, and uh, make sure that you have adequate quality nutrients, and eat modest portions. Here's a cartoon which shows how serving sizes have increased over the years. Burgers are bigger, cookies are bigger, sodas are bigger, popcorn is bigger in the theater, muffins are bigger, salads are bigger. So portion control is really, really important. Now, blood sugar and insulin are crucial to understand if we want to look at health. The more rapidly the sugar from food is absorbed in the bloodstream, the higher the blood sugar, and the more rapidly the blood sugar increase is, the more rapid the insulin release is from the pancreas. And this prevents your body from being able to respond properly to insulin, resulting in insulin resistance. And insulin resistance then forces your body to store fat and prevents your body from burning fat. Insulin resistance prevents the body from burning fat. It forces the body to store additional fat, and it promotes inflammation, which is the cause of all of the major diseases of aging. Cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, autoimmune disease, all of these are caused by inflammation. So how do you prevent the diseases of aging? They're not caused by getting older. They're caused by how long you've been doing too many of the wrong things and not enough of the right things. The American Heart Association, Diabetes Association, and American Cancer Society all state that 90% of each of these diseases can be prevented with healthy diet and lifestyle choices. Now, if we prevented 90% of these diseases, we wouldn't have a health care crisis. Let me say that again. If we prevented 90% of these diseases, we wouldn't have a health care crisis. So what are the healthy choices? Well, you've got to avoid processed foods, eat small, frequent meals, use medical foods to achieve certain health goals, which I can coach you on, emphasize fresh, organic, natural vegetables, fruit, raw nuts and seeds, legumes, lean, grass-fed meat, wild fish, limited organic dairy and limited whole grain, which should be non-gluten-containing grain. Exercise, at least 30 minutes of moderate exercise five days a week. Stress management and high-quality targeted nutritional supplements. That's the recipe for promoting health. What are some of the best nutritional supplements to use? Well, I consider a high-quality refined fish oil 
product to be foundational nutrition for everybody. These are referred to as omega-3 fatty acids, specifically EPA and DHA. What this relates to is that the fat in your diet becomes part of your cell membranes, and your cell membranes, in a very substantial way, are the brains of your cells. Uh, all the cells have a nucleus also, which controls certain processes, but the cell membranes control what goes into the cell and what comes out of the cell. And if you control that, you control everything about that cell. And it's the fat in your cell membrane that determine how well your cells can work. Saturated fats and trans fats from fried foods and other sources decrease the insulin effect on cells and change a lot of other cell signaling pathways. Omega-3 fatty acids from healthy, refined, cold water fish oil improves the effect of insulin and improves these other cell signaling pathways. The other benefits of fish oil is reduced inflammation, thinning the blood, lowers triglycerides. It's also excellent for brain health. A multivitamin trace mineral supplement is also absolutely essential for foundational nutrition for everybody to take. Most produce is grown in depleted soils. And because of that, extra nutrients are necessary to have optimal levels of these nutrients in your body. In addition, our high stress, highly toxic environment requires additional nutrients in order to prevent disease and optimize health. Vitamin D is also essential for everybody to take. Now, I test vitamin D on all of my patients that I order blood tests on, and I found that virtually everybody is low. Everybody I've tested is suboptimal, but most people are actually low. Now, the recommended daily allowance of 400 IUs achieves lab values in a blood test of about 20, and it prevents rickets. That's the deficiency disease of not enough vitamin D. Rickets leads to deformed bones, bow-leggedness, and that kind of stuff. But what we really want is a lab value of 75 because that value results in a 75% decreased risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer and a 30 to 70% risk reduction of eight other cancers. It also prevents autoimmune disease. It prevents juvenile diabetes. It enhances immune system function, reduces the effect of aging on your brain, leads to a healthier, happier mood, has a bunch of other healthy benefits. A level of 400 IUs a day just won't do that. So is this kind of a program expensive? Well, we're looking at some lab testing, cost of consultation, these classes that you take, medical foods, multivitamin mineral supplement, a fish oil supplement, and healthier groceries. Yeah, there's some cost to it. Well, if you take a look at what you're already spending on unhealthy foods, it adds up to a fairly good chunk of money. You know, Big Mac meal, Carl's Jr., Starbucks, it all adds up. And if you stop eating that kind of stuff and eat healthier foods instead, a lot of it will be a wash. It won't really cost you much. Let's look, for example, at what the cost of not doing anything is. You know, the cost of diabetes. Over 17 million people in this country have diabetes. 151,000 of those are under the age of 20. For an overall cost in this country of $98 billion per year, that's $5,765 per diabetic per year. In addition to that, what's the value of your eyesight? What's the value of your limbs? Because diabetics oftentimes have their limbs amputated because diabetes leads to poor circulation of blood. What's the cost of heart disease? It's the number one killer in this country. There's a death every 34 seconds, 710,000 in 1997. One cardiac stent costs $30,000. Quadruple bypass surgery costs more than a quarter of a million dollars. The first patient of mine that signed up for this class had recently gone through a heart stent surgery for which he spent $30,000. That was because of his two donut a day diet. How much healthy food, vitamins and minerals, fish oil, and organic produce would $30,000 buy? Basically, you spend your money now on, on food that leads to a healthy outcome, or you're going to spend a lot more than that treating the sickness and disease you get because you didn't make healthy choices. The choice is yours. So how do you prevent heart attack? No smoking, manage your weight properly, healthy diet away from sugars and saturated fat, and high in folate fiber and fish oil, moderate exercise, half hour of walking a day, bicycling, rollerblading, other activities you probably enjoy anyway, and moderate alcohol consumption. So the therapeutic lifestyle approach relates to nutrition, exercise, and stress management. And we're going to go over each of these in much more detail over the next several classes. So how do you make these changes? Well, it takes about 45 days to change a habit or incorporate a new one. And it's not always upwards and onwards. There'll be some false steps, some false starts. You'll take 10 steps forward and two backwards. You'll make healthy choices three, four, five days in a row, and then you'll make an unhealthy choice or two. That's okay. The overall effect is going to be in a positive direction. So the best thing to do is to commit to making healthy choices in one aspect of your life for the next two weeks. After two weeks of doing that, ask yourself, are you willing to keep making that healthy choice for the next two weeks? Every two weeks, renew your commitment to making the healthy choices you've already made and ask yourself what other healthy choices you're willing to start now. So... What are some action steps for you to take right now? Well, decide which healthy choices you're willing to start right now. 
today and which of those choices you can commit to for doing for the next two weeks. Every two weeks, renew your commitment to continuing those healthy choices and ask yourself what other things you're willing to commit to for the next two weeks. Continue that pattern and you're going to see your health and your life improve. Some of you will make more healthy choices faster than others. Some of you will make just one new healthy choice every two weeks. It doesn't really make that much difference how fast you get there or how many healthy choices you make. The end result is going to be the same. Of course, the more healthy choices you make, the faster you progress and the more likely you are to avoid certain diseases. So that's all for this presentation. Thank you very much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you for the next presentation.